Thank you very much. I know you've been here all day, so I heard one or two of you sigh yet another talk. Uh, I can tell you if, you, if you think about the relationship between a speaker and the audience, there's always this interesting energy field around. And in this case, I am much more intimidated than you are bored. <laughs> Uh, because you know, I don't usually get to talk in front of rooms with this size of collective brain power. So, uh, if my voice is a bit shaky or my story not very coherent, it's because your energy is intimidating me. I, I have a few um, warnings before I start. I am Dutch, <laughs> which means my English is somewhat broken. But more importantly, my diplomatic skills are missing. <laughs> They're not there. So occasionally I will say things either because I don't understand the language or because I'm just being raised rudely, right? So I apologize up front. I won't apologize during the talk because it, whatever comes out, comes out is my experience. Um, I, am, I am not a scientist. Um, I'm a business person. I've been in business all my life. The last 20 years, well, actually the last three years, I've been with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which I'll talk a bit about what it is, but you know, that's it. Uh, before that, I was 10 years CEO of a large global transport group called TNT. So if you're into the infrastructure business, I'm sure you know TNT. It's, if you're American, it's the FedEx of Europe. That's kind of the simple way to look at it. If you're German, it's not the orange, but it's, it's not the yellow, but it's the orange boys and girls. That's TNT. Before CEO, I was five years CFO at TNT. So I know capital markets. I know running large global businesses and I got to practice a little bit in sustainability, first inside TNT, where we became one of the first leaders. We were Dow Jones super sector leader for four consecutive years, which means it's the only objective measure. Well, I don't even know if it's objective. The only kind of measure the world has for measuring sustainable performances in a business. We were pretty okay in that. But in, towards the end of my career as CEO, we, my supervisory board, the wise people supervising me got more and more letters that I was very interested and keen in sustainability and not so interested in their interests being the share price. And therefore, I should be fired with no delay, which I was able to delay for one and a half more years, but then decided that um, I needed to move to the World Business Council. The reason I joined the World Business Council and that's an interesting personal insight, but also relevant to the story, is I was lucky. I got the job of CEO of a 180,000 people company on, at the age of 40, which is slightly earlier than most people. I left when I was 50. So I, I don't know if you call that a midlife crisis or a, some other crisis, but I wanted to get serious about life. So I, I decided to go deep and full time into sustainability. Um, but the reason why I did that is because my generation, the people who are 50 or 53 today, is the first generation of CEOs who gets it, which is, you know, one of those comments to make. Because the generation before me, not, this does not apply to scientists, you are very bright people, you, <laughs> you got this stuff way before we business people did. But in business, the generation before me is completely trained and modeled in shareholder value-centric thinking. I was trained in shareholder value-centric thinking, but I got to see the internet and there are more things than shareholders to think about. The next generation, the people who are now 35 or 30, they will possibly be trained better, which is actually not true which is not, I know it's not science, but it's academic, and we business people quite never know what is the difference between academics and scientists. One of the big fights we are having as the World Business Council is we need to revolutionize MBAs. The problem that MBAs have today is they put sustainability in their curriculum as voluntary modules that people may or opt in or opt out of 
we need to revolutionize that. We need to put stakeholder thinking, or what I call integrated performance management, in the core of an MBA curriculum instead of shareholder-centric thinking. And until we do that, we're not going to generate enough leaders who will take business to a better place. Uh, and so that's one of the points. But I'll, I'll, I'll have more of these one-liners for you to challenge when I'm in the panel later. Uh, WBCSD is a very interesting group. It's 200 of the largest companies in the world. You see all the famous logos. Since I joined, 24% of the members left, <laughs> which, which I consider a compliment. I'm the only president of a membership-based organization who's proud of scaring 24% of his members away. The good news, and that's probably the reason why I can talk about it, we've been able to replace all of them. But now we're getting the people like Apple, like IKEA, and, and much more forward thinking. Um, who of you are Americans? Good, welcome. I, I have... I have had to completely be re-educated because in the beginning I was saying we are the progressive voice of business. But then somebody in the US explained to me progressive is left of Obama. You don't want to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> Obama is bad enough apparently in some circles. So um, we, are, we are the forward thinking voice of business. That's who we are. Um, but the good news is last week, Climate Week, Climate Summit in New York, Tim Cook the CEO of Apple came on stage and held a very good story about what Apple was going to do about climate change. So we're beginning to see a movement where the 50, 55-year-old CEOs are stepping up to the plate, and it's no longer just Paul Pullman of Unilever making noise, as good as a noisemaker he is. We, WBCSD, run a global network. We're in 71 countries, with the simple notion that we can look at global challenges and think about global solutions, but implementation will have to happen nationally. And that's why we need national networks. So this morning I was at the Austrian BCSD here in Vienna. Tomorrow I'll actually be in the Swiss BCSD in Zurich. And that's one of these things. You, you, we need to link up with national entities. And, and I think you must have talked about that today as well, we actually need to link up with mega cities because even national governments have their limitations, particularly on executional power, as we probably all know. I don't need to tell you this, but the world has become extraordinarily complex and is getting complexer by the day. Um, you know, if you're a business person, these are some of the pictures that just astonish you. Of course, Business people tend to get a lot of hang up on the economic performance. And the economic performance has been very interesting. Like I said, I've been a CFO and a CEO, i.e. In the, in the senior management layers of large global companies for 15 years. Um, in 2008, the economic, the financial crisis leading to a global economic crisis hit, which was strange enough, the first major economic crisis that this generation of management had to steer through. So occasionally we ask ourselves, why doesn't the world respond any smarter to these things? Well, because it's the first time we're in the middle of it. And that's part of, of, of that complication. And that's part of why business people tend to get a hang up on, geez, we don't know if the economy is better. You want to talk to me about sustainability? I don't even know if my company exists next year. But the world is getting incredibly complex. You know, I've, I've put a picture of Ebola up. I don't know if there's health scientists in the room, but the news in New York last week, there were 1,400 people affected two weeks ago. There will be 1.4 million three months from now under Ebola. If that happens, it's going to be a global crisis. I know from my TNT days that my risk manager, risk manager would take the board through a bird flu simulation. What would I do if bird flu became a global epidemic? Is that the English word? And how would that affect our operations if 50% of the people would not be allowed to come to, the, to their job? You know, what would you do? And I always sat there you know, looking very seriously as a CEO would do. But I was thinking in the back of the mind, why the, am I here? You know, this is a nonsense. This is a theory. Well, it ain't theory anymore. This, this may well happen. And I'm not so sure any of us, certainly in business, are well prepared for the occasion. The picture at the bottom left for you is Mr. DiCaprio. 
the, the reason I put it up there is the best speech last week in the General Assembly during the Climate Week was his. There was this lady from the Maladives. She was pretty impressive too, but that's because she brought her baby onto the stage and we all started crying. You know, that's, that's a cheap trick. But <laughs> DiCaprio, DiCaprio, he walked up there and he said, very simple but powerful message, I am a pretender for a living. I'm an actor. I pretend to be characters. You, presidents of the world, pretend climate change doesn't happen. You better stop that. I thought it was a very powerful message. Well, the bottom right, I don't need to talk to you about the planetary boundary framework is, of course, one of those complications. The thing to note, though, and that's a message that we're spreading across everybody in business when it's about sustainability, is everything in sustainability is related. There's almost no topic that is just a topical topic. Everything has relations. So, I thought this is the smartest room I probably have ever spoken to. So I put four numbers onto the screen and asked you to tell me the correlation. And all your left brains are now in overgear and you're beginning to think, geez, what is the mathematical? There's mathematical analysis people in the room. Like, stop your left brain, use your right one because there is no correlation, I can tell you. But I'll give you some details. Every six seconds, a child dies from hunger. Another child just died from hunger in our world. 18,000 children die each day from hunger. We forget to talk about it because it happens every day and it's been happening for more than 20 years, so kind of who cares? But if it's your kid, you would care, right? Six seconds. Um, I live in Geneva these days. This is a picture of Lake Geneva. It takes three hours by car to drive around it. The deepest point is 800 meters. I can fill Lake Geneva three times over with the amount of water in this issue. This issue assume, uh, absorbs 11% of the world's CO2 emissions. So if climate change is the big issue, here's 11% for you. And we leave $750 billion of economic value on the table in this issue. So now you tell me, what's the issue? You still don't know. It's food, loss, and waste in the world. We, the world, all of us, we lose 34% of the food we produce. And yet we kill a child every six seconds as a result of hunger, or we generate 11% of the emissions in that production, or we leave $750 billion. If we fixed food loss and waste. Children wouldn't have to die. We could grow the population without having to worry about nutrition, and somebody would make a lot of money. But we don't think about the interdependencies enough. And this is just food loss and waste. You, you could do the same with climate and water and social issues. It's always interdependent. And therefore, our point of view is the world, and, and you know this better than I, the world is in a systemic crisis. We should stop fighting elements. We should think holistically. And that's what we're trying to bring. Governments cannot save us at the moment. Governments are, like much of business, struck by short-termism, re-election cycles, and the likes. And in the US, it's even worse because it's become polarized. And Unfortunately, many of the important issues are no longer the issues, but are whose side are you on? The, there are two other big change agents in the world. One is all of us, the citizens of our planet. That's called a revolution. If you've read or have heard of the book, This Will Change Everything, of Naomi Klein, came out last week, I would advise you guys to read it because you may think of Naomi what you like. I mean, I'm sure scientists have very educated views of her. She may be too populist, I know, but she studied the topics well. She's saying governments won't fix it, fix it. corporations can't be trusted, we need revolution. Cluck. And that's what she's calling for. Um, but the second or the third engine of change is uh, business. And my role these days is to get business to become the agent for change. And that means we need to scale up solutions. In business, we're, we're relatively simple people, I have to admit. And I've told you about my intimidation. Everything in business 
can be translated back to four words. Plan, do, check, act. That's all business does. Plan, do, check, act. Um, if you've ever been in business, business makes a budget. Business starts doing work. Business creates a quarterly report, checks if we're aligned with budget. If not, we fire people. That's normally the answer uh, to get the cost back in line with the budget. That's kind of the simple rhythm of business. We're very good in business in applying this in financial management. The financial performance of business mostly through the crisis has been okay. We do not, or have until now, not applied that to environmental or social issues. And yet we should. If that's the way business operates, that's how we should get sustainability into business. So we've worked on creating a set of priorities and we're driving business to create plans for innovation. The second thing we need to do is we need to fundamentally change capitalism. And this means we need to change the way we think about business cases. There is no way, and, and I hope we, there's somebody here who disagrees because then the night gets fun. There is no way we can save the planet or our civilization or become sustainable within the current economic theories that we operate in. Resource scarcity, inequality, it will not be fixed unless we change the economic rules, unless we start pricing externalities, think differently about risk management, disclosures and valuations. And that's the, the business case. The third thing, and that's actually the reason I'm here tonight, we need to get a little bit smarter about the way we collaborate. I represent some of the mightiest economic forces on the planet. You know, I've talked about Apple, Unilever, you know, any company, Toyota is on there. Big corporations with enormous footprints. But the challenges are too big for each of them or for all of them collectively to figure out what the solutions are. Governments need to be collaborated with. We need smarter policies to bring solutions to scale. But, and that's been a missing area so far, we need to get much closer to science. And science needs to adjust its tune occasionally as well. Um, my role in speeches is to wake people up and I, I always start very kindly by saying, you know, I have no diplomatic skills and I use that to insult my audiences normally. I'll do that tonight as well, don't worry. But then I'll talk what I think science should do. A few years ago, we published a thing called Vision 2050. I'm sure you have at one point come across it. It's become quite famous. It's the first time global business said business as usual is not sustainable. The definition of a sustainable world is this one. We're going to move to a world with more than 9 billion people. Some people even begin to say it could be more than 10 billion people by the mid of this century. We want all people to live well, you know, probably not have as beautiful a location as, as this, but at least they shouldn't die from hunger. They should have access to energy, health, and, uh, and, and uh, education. And together we need to live within the boundaries of the planet. I don't know if it's scientific or not, I, I would assume it is, but the, the, the report that WWF published yesterday on the global footprint is a clear indicator that we're not within the boundaries today. We're going to more than double the middle class consumption in the world, uh, so this will only be stretched more. We have said in this notion of plan, do, check, act, why is climate change? I asked this simple question three years ago. I, I had spoken to about 40 CEOs in my first few months in, in this job. And I came back to the office saying, why is climate change like a religion? You know, you believe it or you don't believe it. I mean, I just don't understand this, you know. And I mean, you know, I'm sure you can have long conversations about what will happen as a result of climate change 50 years from now, but you can't really argue climate change, can you? It's just a set of facts. And where do we find these facts? Well, we find them in science. So. I, I apologized and had to admit I had no, no knowledge of IESA at that time. I should have come here, maybe. But I went to the Stockholm Resilience Center, to Johan Rockström, who is, his name is as close to a rock star as we could find, so we, we kind of bonded well. Um, he taught us everything there is to know about the planetary boundary framework. We used that. So we took all the facts from science, 
which are fabulous when it comes to natural capital. We looked at the trends for societal or social capital, because I think, maybe that's my lack and you will educate me, the social capital science needs to catch up a bit with natural capital science. We don't know enough about societal tensions or change, behavioral change type of things. So we looked at the trends there and we set ourselves priorities, translated them into goals, translate them into business solutions. And that's what we're doing because that's what business is really good at. We're not scientists, you are the scientists, but we need to talk. And just a few comments of reflections on that process. It took us 12 months with 60 global companies and up to 800 scientists at different points in the travel. In the first 12 months, and we were talking about the same things, you know, we had sessions on climate change, on unemployment, on whatever the topics would have been. We were talking about the same things and yet we were not understanding a word the other party would say. You know, and we were, we were less educated than the scientific people were, but we were still effortlessly educated and some of my colleagues actually spoke English. So, and it was like as if we were talking like this until the word risk entered the room. And then all of a sudden, clack, there was a connection. And that's my one lesson. If, if science wants to talk to business, talk in terms of risk, it will immediately connect the community. And I know you, you have been talking about risk today. These are the priorities that came out of our work. Uh, we, as I said, like to talk in slightly more simplistic language than science does. So we talk green is natural capital, blue is social capital. That's the way we talk. And, and so coming back to we need to change capitalism, Fundamentally, capitalism is an okay model. The mistake we made is we have only identified financial capital as capital. And that's the mistake in capitalism which needs to be corrected. We, business, are also using natural capital and social capital. And if you look into the integrated report, there's a few more like uh, whatever it is, human capital, manufactured capital, intellectual capital. But that's too much for me to remember. So natural, social, financial. And we need to balance that in our decision making. And that's what we're going to do going forward. Well, I, there's lots of other global trends. I won't bore you with that. So I'm going to click through. Otherwise, I'm going to talk way too long. The, the connected one, this is, a, this is an I'll leave this one on because it's a beautiful picture of a mountain in Austria with a girl working on her iPad. And, uh, two weeks ago, I was in the refugee camp Dadaab just in Somalia because I'm also a global ambassador against hunger, so I was checking how Dadaab is doing. Um, and it's very weird, you know, you're in an environment where about 100 kids a day still die from the famine and the aftermath of that. And your Blackberry, or in my case, the iPhone works perfectly well. And every five seconds a message comes in from somebody, so it's like weird. It's not that weirdness that I want to talk to you about in the Dutch language. Are there any Dutch people in the room? Yeah, kind of, if you, hey, hello. In the Dutch language, there's a beautiful saying. For trou this, this, I think it applies to science as well. Well, science, it actually applies because there's been quite some fraud in the scientific community recently. At least there were cases in the Netherlands. I don't know if that has spread <laughs> across the borders. But there certainly applies to business that is, Nobody outside this room really trusts us. I don't know if scientists feel that pressure. We business people feel a lot of that. If a business person speaks in public, the level of trust in what he or she has to say is low, particularly if he wants to talk about saving the world because you're only saving your own wallet, aren't you? That type of trust. So there's a saying in the Dutch language that is vertrouwen, trust, Komt to foot, comes by foot, meaning very slow, leaves on a horse, much faster. I, I, I'm sure every language will have some kind of, trans, it translates rather awfully in English, I know. I've tried the German language, didn't help, but it comes by foot, it, you lose it a lot easier than you win it. That, that saying is hundreds of years old, and it's no longer true. Trust still comes by foot, very, very slow, it leaves by Facebook. 
And it, no, no, but it's serious. It's a very important notion because it changes everything. It has changed the Arab Spring. It changes the way business needs to manage its reputation. It changes the way you, as scientific community, need to think about whatever results you want to um, distribute across the world. It's a very fundamental thing we need to manage. So we're going to innovate business solutions. And I'll just take climate change. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the rail infrastructure in Europe. Sorry for the infrastructure people. <clears throat> but um, I'll take climate change as an example, because I think it's an area where uh, science and business can really work well together. So at the end of next year, the whole world will gather in Paris for what is called the COP21, the Convention of Parties 21 which actually, if you don't know what it means, it is the 22nd or 21st year in con con whatever, consecutive year that all the governments of the world are trying to get to a, an agreement on climate change. You know, we know we have an issue and we keep trying and we've promised ourselves that end of next year we're going to make a deal. And we practiced that a little bit last week in New York. That's kind of how you should think about it if you're not into the climate space. So anyway, we're, we're going there. At the bottom, there's the journey for the governments. So we're gonna, we've met last week in New York. We're going to meet again in Lima, in Peru, in December. Then events will happen in Davos. And then in December 2015, in Paris, all the governments will meet. And hopefully, a global climate change agreement will come out. We, together with SDSN, the Jeffrey Sachs Solution, Sustainable Development Solution Network, together with IDRI, and since this afternoon, together with IASA, will work out a series of business solution and technology roundtables. What are business solutions or technologies that can solve climate change? What are the technological barriers? What are the market acceptance barriers? What are the policy requirements? And what are the financing requirements to get these solutions to scale? The simple notion is, if we can say technology is fixed, money is available, policy will be given to you, and the market will buy it, no CEO in the world will refuse his company to be part of it. And then we finally create a movement that business will be part of the solution rather than sitting in five-star hotels having side events to the, the main mission. But this is something where I see science play a major role. These are solutions we're working at and going to work out in the next 18 months. So they're wide ranging, you know, and, and they cover a big part of what IASA has in its work programs, whether it's forest, land use, CCS, carbon capture, renewables, cities, mobility, or, you know, anything else that is uh, on that sheet. Um, we need to improve the business case. It's very clear, and it would be good to get more economic theory under it, by the way. So if anyone can help us there, please do. But the cost of inaction is already larger than the cost of action. This picture is just one example. This is the Honda assembly line in southern Thailand a day after a mud flood hit this, the place for the second consecutive year. The insurance company of Honda has now said this site is no longer insurable because the event is more than one in a hundred years and the damage is rather sizable, as you can see, because they had to write off this whole lot of cars. More and more sites in global supply chains will become uninsurable, i.e. the risk profile for doing business in those places will completely change, i.e. the cost of doing business and therefore the cost of doing something against these things is going to work out favorably. We're going to move to a world of radical transparency. If you're in the STG meetings, if you're in the climate change meetings, every business, every government, by the way, as well, but every business will have to move towards sustainability reporting very soon to measuring and paying for the externalities, i.e. carbon pricing, soon thereafter, and going to integrated reporting next. And there's enormous amounts of initiatives in the world, whether it's integrated reporting, global reporting initiatives, or SASPs. This is inevitable and will happen. In the next five years, capitalism will change, and that will then lead to better valuations. 
So let me talk for two minutes about what I think science should do different. I think science was brilliant in scaring the hell out of all of us. It took a while for the world to get serious about it. It took way too long for the world to recognize the things that science has been telling us for many years. But being in New York last week, I kind of get the impression the world is beginning to understand that climate is an issue. And it's not just climate change, but that's because New York was such a big thing. Continue to update the world on the facts as they unfold. I would say be a little bit more courageous. What does not help if there is a storm out there that you know the first scientist comes onto the television and he said, well, we can't really say this storm is related to climate change, but there is this pattern which is beginning to emerge. And then the Fox News guy will say, so you don't know if this is related to climate change, so it's not related to climate change, let's move to the next topic. A little more courage in how we talk about these things could be used, if I'm honest. Translate these facts, and I think you're beginning to do that, but, but let's work very closely together. Translate them in actual risk assessments. You know, there's insurance and reinsurance companies who are keenly interested to get this information and translate it into business models, into investment decisions. The third thing is be part of the solutions. So let's make sure we use all your collective brain power and all the institutes that, that you guys represent. But think about two things when it comes to solutions. What does it take to scale up technologies that we know exist? So what is the trick for scaling up? And the second one is, what fundamental R&D do we need? Uh, a simple one is, we need batteries for electric vehicles that can run 1,000 kilometers rather than 100 kilometers that my BMW i3 gives me today. Because I'm stupid enough to put my money in it because I'm in this job, so I have to. But no sensible uh, citizen will do the same. And that's stopping us. We need a breakthrough. So there's fundamental work, but the scale-up work, I would say, is equally important. My last point is... Um, we need much more scientific input in behavioral science, behavioral change. In business, when I talk to a business community, I always say, we are extreme, we're getting better at the supply side of demand, meaning we kind of know a lot about energy efficiency, resource productivity, and, and renewable energy type of... We're very, very poor yet at the demand side of sustainability. We do not know how to change buying patterns of consumption. We actually, as business, are kind of scared of it because it might mean selling less and our whole model is selling more. But behavioral science is a key missing element in it. This picture is anyone who is serious about sustainability or focused on climate change. I mean, I have actually looked up the word leadership in the dictionary, given my broken English. And if you go back in the English language to the origins of the word leadership, you will find a very simple notion. It means path finder. That's what leadership is. And nowhere else than in sustainability is finding the path the thing we need to do, because I don't think any of us have the answer. My last slide is always the same for about uh, four and a half months now because a very dear friend of mine has passed away. And um, you know, it's always sad, I know, and we all experience that as we grow older, unfortunately. But this one was special because he was an astronaut, probably even the first European astronaut. And he was a close buddy, so we had lots of talks about the world and where things were going. And he asked me to tell people his story. So here I go. I promised him to do this for a year, so you have to suffer through it for 10 seconds. Whenever you go on a space trip, has anybody in the room ever done that? <laughs> I, know, I know, it's kind of weird, you know? None of us do. Um, but if you were to go on a space trip, at one point in the trip, you would make the mistake that every astronaut makes that will change his or her life. And that is simple, you will look out of the window. And then when you do that, you will see this beautiful little blue ball in a sea of absolute nothing. 
And you know, because you can't walk in space without a suit, that the absolute nothing will kill you before you even realized what happened to you. But the little blue ball is our, our spaceship. The second thing you will see is when you look down, all you see is land and water. There are no borders. There is no Frau Merkel and Mr. Obama and all the other characters that we have made important. There's just land and there is water. And the third thing you will see is, you can't see it really on this projection, but there is this paper thin layer around this little blue ball, which we call the atmosphere. And we are kind of polluting the atmosphere and we can't do that forever. So the reason I'm here is because, not because I'm from business and you're from science or you're from government and I'm from business or whatever labels we stick on our little suits. We're all astronauts of this little spaceship called planet Earth. And I really hope and call on you to work together to save this beautiful blue ball. Thank you. <laughs>